So welcome uh, to Stargaze. Uh, I'm Marlon Ross. I'm a volunteer here at Novak, and uh, I'm happy to present Lyle Mars. Uh, today he's going to be giving a talk. Uh, Lyle is a geologist at the U.S. Geological Service specializing in geologic remote sensing. He has been an amateur astronomer since the late 1960s. Some would say not so much an amateur. amateur. Uh, uh, his current astronomical interest is in video astronomy, the capture and display of astronomical images in near real time. In particular, Lyle enjoys the capture and display of galaxies using his 14-inch schmidt cassegrain grain telescope and astronomical one-shot color camera. Please take it away. John. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so uh, today, I, I want to also talk a little bit about, well, how did I get into this? Because, you know, this is a hobby. This is something we enjoy doing. And um, when I first started out about, four, well, with this particular telescope about 10 years ago, within two years, I had done the Messier or 100 list for the Messier list, and I had already done the Herschel 400 list. So in two years, I had knocked all of that out. That's 500 objects in the nighttime sky, and that's just trying to find them in a, in a scope. Now, I had a big scope, a C-14. Um, the problem was that when I went to the Herschel 2 list, that's another 400 objects, my description started looking like faint, fuzzy object, indescript. That was it. I mean, I couldn't see anything more. And it started to occur to me that I was either going to have to get a bigger scope, you know, one with a trailer and, uh, you know, a, a really big dub and a divorce lawyer because my wife was probably going to divorce me if I did that, or I could go to a camera. Now, the other thing that really convinced me that this was the way to go instead of going to a 24-inch stop was I happened to be set up one night doing public observing. This was about eight years ago, and I was looking at the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, you can't see the whole galaxy through a scope like this. It's a very narrow field of view. But I had a beautiful image of the core and of 101 and the dwarf galaxy 102, and I'm really proud, and I'm showing people, and I'm going, oh, this is great. And I happened to look up, and we had another club member there named Michael Hester. And Mike was very interested in using cameras. And he had a camera set up and was displaying on a little screen his shot of Andromeda Galaxy after a one-minute collect off a 90-millimeter telescope. And it was spectacular. And that told me right then, that's the way to go. Um, I want to do that. And what I'm going to do today in this talk if I can get this operating correctly, is I want to first, you know, let's give a definition. I'm a scientist. We've got to always have a definition or what are we doing. Then I want to talk about the telescope equipment, the software and procedures that you do in video astronomy. I want to focus a little bit on the camera and focal reducers. Focal reducers really are very important and sometimes they're kind of confusing as to what's their purpose. So I'll talk about that. I want to show some results. I've got to show off what I'm doing. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about three different current cameras on the market that you could use um, to do this kind of work. So what is video astronomy? Um, essentially, and this is my definition, it's the use of a camera to do near real-time displays on the field of whatever it is you're looking at. In this case, typically one minute or less. So the camera takes a, a one-minute exposure and you pop it up on a screen and show it to everybody. Um, I've had two systems that I've used to do this. And that's going to be part of the focus on this talk today is an easy system to use and a not-so-easy system to use. They both have advantages uh, with either video system. And if you look at the way the market is today, that's really the way they've gone. You have a very easy, simple system to use. The image pops up on the screen and you're done. Or you can stack images and keep them and maybe process them later. So here I have um, uh, NGC 891 Edge on Galaxy. And I've taken it through my two camera systems that I had. The Malin Cam is on, the, on your right-hand side. 
Um, that's 55 seconds of exposure. Now, if we were to look at this through my C14, just through an eyepiece, off, you would not see it here. You need to go to some place like, um, like almost Heaven Star Party. You would just barely see a faint glow of this, and you might see the dust lane through the middle. 55 seconds on the Mellon cam, and this is what you've got. Now, this is my current system I have. I, uh, the Mellon cam versus the Atik 314L. And, you know, both are pretty good. This one is lower resolution. You can see some pixelation on the stars here. They're nice round stars here. Um, this one has got very good cooling capability. So the background is darker than this one here. Um, but it doesn't uh, illuminate as much of the galaxy as this one does. So in the field, after 55 seconds, bam, you can have an image like that on a low-resolution monitor. That's pretty amazing. And um, I use this system over here for about two years. Oh, two years. I don't know if I can fig figure it out. Two years until it finally, unfortunately, it stopped working. Instead of getting it fixed, I wanted to try another, me other method. Um, the advantage to this system after 55 seconds, you have a fairly decent image. But the real advantage is, is that it stacks images. So at night, I'm with the telescope. The first image up is this one. But then after seconds, it takes this image, and it takes a new image, and stacks it on top of this. So after about 10 minutes, this is the kind of image I have. I don't know if you can see the difference between one or the other. But that's a pretty sweet image. You have very good detail of the galaxy. This is the have your cake and eat it too system. You can have some nice images to show out in the field and then have a really nice image at the end of say 10 or 20 minutes of stacking to take home with you, which is why I went with this. But as you're going to see in the talk, there's a lot more involved to do this kind of work. So let's talk about the telescope, software, equipment, and procedures for video astronomy. So we have two systems here. I'm going to talk about the one that I currently use. Is it cutting out? OK. OK. One, two, three. OK. So. First, I'm going to talk about the, the new system that I have, and then I'll talk about the Mellon Camp. So the new, the new system that I currently have, um, I still have the C14. Now, I use the C14 in both of these, these images. So this is the C14 telescope. But essentially, the new system I have involves essentially everything you use in classical astrophotography. Um, to run this system, first off, I need a guide scope. So here's the guide scope sitting up here. Um, it's got you know, an adjustable flip lens on it, so I can adjust the guide scope to look for a star. I can look for bright stars through here, anything that's nearby the object, so I can track and keep that object right in the center of the field of view. If that object drifts at all when I'm stacking over, say, a 10-minute period of time, it's going to blur the image that I'm producing. So I have to have something like that. Um, in addition, fine focus. Uh, when you have the kind of resolution um, you have with my newer system, and I'll talk about the resolution of that camera in a minute, you've got to have something like this. You've got to have a fine focus to, to focus it. By the way, the camera for the, you have a camera on the guide scope. Here's the little camera on the back end of this coming off here. That's the guide scope. So you've got to have a guide scope camera and fine focus. You've got to have fine focus on the uh, telescope as well because you have just enough resolution. It really makes a big difference. It's much easier on a system like this. This has a has a mirror focus where I can just move the mirror back and forth. But here I've got a Crayford focus hanging hanging off the back end of this in order to try and do fine focus. Finally, and by the way, there's the main camera right there on the end. The the big thing about this kind of work is you've got to have a German equatorial mount. Why? So for the, the uh, group in the audience here that doesn't understand that, the German equatorial mount rotates around on an axis just and, and can track objects in the nighttime sky as it rotates on its axis. So if you start um, in the east, and let's say you're looking at a star that just so happens to have a thumb on it, and it's like this, as you look at it in the nighttime sky, 
By the time you get to the other side, it's like this. So not only does it, you track it across the sky, the, the object actually rotates. The German equatorial mount holds it in that same position. So as the nighttime sky goes, it stays like this. If you have an alt azimuth mount, and that would be something like, say, this tripod on this camera here, as you look at the image overnight, it will do that. It will tend to rotate. So you can imagine if you're taking 10 or 20 minutes worth of exposure, the image seems to do this, and that's going to blur the image out. So you've got to have a German equatorial mount, or if you have a Dobsonian, you've got to have an equatorial platform, which does the same thing. So these are all you know, pretty expensive, very involved pieces of equipment to do this type of work. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about what you've got to use to control and do this. So on my system, I have the uh, camera with some long USB cords going out to the computer. I have a computer to control it. Remember, I have a telescope that I've got to control and an auto guider I've got to control. And then I have all the software for that camera, which I'll talk about in more detail, all on the computer. And then what I do is I have a 24-inch LCD screen that I then take the image and plop it off over here. You also have to have some way to remotely control your telescope. You, you don't want to have all of this equipment scattered all around the, the telescope. You want it away so you can shade it and protect it from, uh, or keep the light from uh, polluting other, other scopes. So here you can see my solution. Actually, I originally had remote control software for the, uh, for the, uh, the, the computer. Now I just have a long cable <laughs> for my hand controller. Notice I also have just some red plastic over it. Again, the problem with these systems are is they, they let off a lot of light. And the last thing you want to do is, particularly if you're at almost heaven star party, you've traveled hundreds of miles, is you want to disturb the person next to you who's also traveled hundreds of miles by having all that light spill into their eyes. My answer to that is this. I use a sports umbrella. The nice thing about this is that it's also a great way to keep the dew off the systems. You can also just buy, they have these individual uh, hoods that could sit over each one of these items if you want, but it's very critical to think about how much light these things are putting out. And there is another view. The fun thing about this is that many times when I'm out doing uh, public events, I'll be back here with a bunch of people looking at something and I'll come around and somebody is looking through the little guide scope up here on the, on the telescope thinking that's the view. So that's always fun. Ah, you've got to come back here behind the tent. Okay. So let's talk about, well, what's the procedure and operations and what all do I need to do this with this type of system where I'm doing video astronomy, but I'm stacking the image. Well, first off, up here, and this doesn't come through very well. I hope you can see this. Uh, in red, you have to do the go-to setup, star alignment. On my system, you have to do that. Then you have to do polar alignment. In other words, you have to try and get the, the axis of that German equatorial mount pointed towards celestial pole. The problem with Celestron is that once you do that, you've got to go back and do the alignment again, the go-to alignment. So there's 30 to 40 minutes shot right there trying to get that all done. Um, then, once that's done, you have to lock onto the object for imaging, and you've got to start the star auto-guiding system. So remember, I have that auto guider on top. There's a little program. The one I use is PhD guiding software. Um, and I'll bring that up, and then I'll lock on to a star using that software and that guiding scope. I'll adjust it around until I find a bright, bright star. And that will lock on, and then it, it controls the telescope movement to try and keep that object dead center. If it, that object drifts at all, the images are blurred. Then I start the capture image software on the Yotic camera. Um, and it captures the image and converts it to a format that I can then, it then dumps into the stacking software. So I have a, st a stacker software, and the one that I use is Deep Sky Stacker Live. It's a fantastic program. It's free um, out there on the web. It will take the image from the capture image, or from the capture software. It will load it in and stack the latest image that it sees. And at that point, I can go into the screen, look at it, and then do adjustments on contrast and brightness. I believe that was a question about how do you get this darker or lighter. That's where I control the image. And then I, I, I go one more step. You can just look at it through Deep Sky Stacker Live, but I take it one more step. 
I take that image and I throw it out on the 24 inch screen where I have Adobe Photoshop going in, in display mode. So to do all of this, you can do it manually, but what I, you know, I, I, to keep it simple, what I use is simple keyboard macro software. So I have it set up to where it does these steps continuously in a 55 second cycle. And I have that done using macro software. Now, I'll show you a system that, when I first did this, they didn't really have this type of system set up yet. But now they do. There are several imagers out there that do this. And I'll show you an example of one that uses this type of, of uh, it, it combines essentially the software for the capture of the image, stack the image, and display the image all in one piece of software. I still do it manually. It's sort of like the difference between automatic and a standard shift. You know, it turns out that that's how fast, you know, th that, that, was, that was the limit on the Mellon cam. And it turns out that's how fast I can get the, the, the macro software to do a complete loop. It just happened to be the same time. You can set it for faster, or actually on this one, I figured out a way to set it faster. You'll see some images where it is faster. I, can, I, I have it set for 30 seconds instead of uh, the other, instead of 55. Okay, so that's the, the previous system. I mean, that's the new system that I use. That's the optic. Now, let's talk about procedures and setup on the Mallon cam. And I only have, oh, yes, question. Is the Mallon cam is Photoshop? No, oh, yes, it is. There is. And I'll, sh yeah, sorry. There we go. How about that? I'll tell you what, I have another, I can just hold it. Okay, all right. All right. So, yes, they do. And I'm gonna, that's one of the products I'm going to show in a few minutes. This one is the Mallon cam VSS. They don't make this one anymore. Um, but if you look at this system, you'll notice some distinct differences between this and the other system. One, no guide scope. That's, that's just a, a finder scope, but the big guide scope is gone. Two, there's no Crayford focuser there. I'm just focusing off the mirror. And three, you don't really need a German equatorial mount. You're doing 55 seconds and that's it, and you're bringing in the next image. You're not stacking them. Infinitely easier system. As far as the control goes, this, there are two cables off here. One goes to the hand control, which is sitting right there, that little white box. The other one goes to the screen. The only reason I have the computer in this particular one is that I was using it as a remote control for the, for the, the uh, telescope. That's the only difference, um, or only reason I have the computer there. Um, you don't really even need the computer. I could actually do it with the hand control. I just didn't know about the long cable at that point. So this is a, an infinitely simpler system to use. So what about procedures? Well, you remember that page of procedures I just had? Here are the procedures for this. You got to do the, um, you do have to do, you do need to do the go-to setup, do the star alignment. Um, and then you can capture and display the object. And as far as adjustment for contrast, uh, another thing that people kind of scoff when they first saw this was that I have the CRT tube here. Uh, uh, contrast and brightness, it's a knob <laughs> on the CRT. That's it. So in two seconds, wham, we've got it uh, set to go. The other nice thing about CRTs is that they have much more superior contrast than LCDs. So you get a really nice looking image. I'll show an example of that. I took a screen capture shot. It still doesn't do it justice, but you get an idea of how, much, how good the contrast is. So that we've got, you got that method. Of course, you get to keep the image, and uh, it, it can look very nice. Or that method, <laughs> your choice. That one, that one you, can, you can store it also. You can store it and stack it, but I found that the images are not, okay. they're not as nice as what I, that I have with the other system. So you can make travel bar photos. Yeah, that's right. So let's talk a little bit about the cameras and focal reducer. In, in particular, the camera first, or the cameras. So the camera that I currently have is an Atik 314L+, Plus one-shot color. First off, it's going to be a one-shot color. If you're into doing the uh, RGBL uh, type camera color shot, it ain't going to work with this. You've got to go with one-shot one color. You don't have enough time to do all of that with the shot. Um, it's a cooled camera. 
Um, I think that's very important if you want to get a really nice dark black, black background. Um, the pixel size, pretty big, 6.45 uh, micrometers per pixel. Um, the pixel array, though, is pretty tiny, uh, 1392 by 1040. What is that, 1.2 megapixels? My camera's 12. <laughs> you know, so they're not very, it's not a very big chip. And I'm going to explain why it's like that in just a minute. Um, the sensor, if you take that and look at it, it's, it's 11, uh, mil 11 millimeter diagonal chip, so not very big at all. So when I mentioned cooled and non-cooled, actually the VSS was cooled, but it, it was a very poor cooling system. And you can see what I'm talking about. The background on this is just not as dark as what you see on this. So this is the 55 second cooled image off the attic. And this is off the Mallon cam. It does make a difference, unless you've got a super sensitive chip and you can take a less time to do it, or if you do uh, darks. And if we're doing video astronomy, you don't have time to do these these darks and these grayscales that they adding that in. It, there's just not time to do it if you want to try and do this and display it for the for people. The Mallon cam chip. I have not cooled. I found out actually it is cooled, uh, but it was a very rudimentary cooling system on it. The pixel size is even bigger, 8.4 by 9.8 micrometers. The pixel array was even smaller, uh, 811 by 508, an 8 millimeter diagonal chip. So again, very small. The thing is, when you're looking at these systems, and uh, any of them, it, both CMOS and CCD, one thing to remember is the bigger the pixel, the more sensitive it's going to be. And that's important because we're trying to capture as much light as possible, as quickly as possible, to throw it out on the display. So that's one reason why we have such big pixels. Why such a small chip? Well, we're doing these short exposure times. And again, as I mentioned, we need a lot of light, as much light as possible, to hit the chip. Um, so in a conventional telescope, most of them, Newtonians, refractors, and particularly schmidt cassegrins we've got to intensify that light. And the only way we can really do that is to focus that light down onto the chip itself. Um, a large, so if you have a large chip, you can imagine there's less light spread over that area. If you have a really tiny chip, you can really intensify and focus the light down on that particular chip. To do that, we use something called a focal reducer. There are a couple of exceptions. I just want to mention them here. If you have a hyperstar modified Schmidt Cassegrain, what you've really done is turned your, your Cassegrain into a Schmidt camera. And those have they're very, very short focal lengths. So you probably won't need a focal reducer for that. Or there are some very fast Newtonian reflectors out there. They're, they're sometimes called astrographs that are also very, very short focal lengths. So what I'm trying to say is what we have to do with most of these telescopes to intensify the light, we're going to shorten the focal length using a focal reducer. So how does that work? Well, I'm a geologist. I carry a hand lens around all the time, so I thought this is the best way to show you. This is what a, how a focal reducer works. It takes the light, you can imagine this is the scope, and it's coming through here, and then it focuses it down into a smaller area, which means it's going to be more intense. Kind of hard to see, but I drew a little square box in there. That's supposed to represent the chip. So that's all a focal reducer is really doing. The trick is, if you're going to get into video astronomy, is getting the right focal reducer and setting it up in the correct way. And that's why I'm spending so much time with this. So on mine, on the present system, and this was also true with the Mellon cam, it looked very similar to this. I have the, uh, the camera here, and this is the body. This is the nose piece right here that comes with the camera. But then I have two extra spacers in here, and then here's a 0.5x focal reduction or focal reducer. Okay, so why have I got the spacers here? Well, first off, what I've got here is a series of schematics down here. If I took this uh, 0.5 focal reduction or focal reducer and just stuck it on the end of the nose chip, the light path would look something like this. It's really designed to do a 0.5 reduction. So if I have a 1,000 millimeter focal length, that takes it to 500. But in this case, some of the light would, I would miss some of the light coming off on either side. And as a matter of fact, the field of view would be smaller, right? That's my field of view 
But this is this, this here's the chip. That's what you're actually seeing. So what you're going what I had did here was I took the the 0.5 focal reduction focal reducer. I put it on the system and I looked at it. And it took a long time. Uh, you know, instead of, in 55 seconds, I had hardly anything illuminated of the object. So I went back and started adding spacers until I got just the right amount. And, and that's through trial and error is what I did it. At one point, I had it out too far, and now all of the light is hitting just a small part of the chip. When you do that, you get an image like this. That's the horse head. And as you can see, I'm just illuminating the center part of the, the, the chip. This is called vignetting. Out here, I'm not getting anything. So that's, that's bad. We don't want to do that. We have to set the focal reducer at the right distance from the chip in order to where we get this set up. And on my system, in doing this, I found that I'm getting about 0 0.35 focal reduction using that. It's a trial and error thing that, you, that I suggest you do. If you get into video astronomy, it makes all the difference in the world in, in how long it takes to get the image and how, what the quality of the image looks like. It's something that I had to play around with. I also want to mention, um, oh, back here, that's why I had this image in here. There, there are all sorts of focal reducers. There's F5, F7, F3. I went with F5. I'm sorry? They do. So you can go out and order. You know, I got quarter-inch spacers, and I just added a quarter-inch each time till I got vignetting, and then I went from there and went back out till there was no vignetting, and that's where I stopped. Okay. There, there are all sorts of focal reducers out there. I've tried the F33 focal reducer that, that, um, or, or 0.33 focal reduction, and it produces a tremendous amount of coma right out of the box. So I, I've gone with F5 and then created my own focal reduction by moving that focal reducer away. But this is what, what, what happens. This is coma, where you get all of these stars here. That they look like comets as you go out to the edge of the, of the scene. So I suggest myself starting with, say, a focal reducer like F5 and move it back and forth with spacers till you get the right, the right looking scene, the right image. Any questions on that? That's kind of... My scope is F11, yeah. And Right, and then I use spacers to take it out even further. And when we say, I, I'm, trying to stay, I'm trying to stay away from the F word. Uh, F as in like F33, F5. I'm trying to use it in terms of how we're really, what we're really doing here. So F5 on an F10 scope is 50% focal reduction. That's all that means. Okay, mine's an F11, so that kind of complicates things a little bit. Um, so that's, that's my story with focal reducers. You're going to have to play around with those a little bit to get the image just right. You might luck out. You might, uh, if you buy it and get the F5 and put it on there, you may get a nice image after 55 seconds. If there's nothing there or it's very, very dim, then you might want to try some spacers to bring the focal reduction down. Okay, the fun part. I get to show some images of what I've been doing. Now, this is with the latest system, and then I'll show an image from uh, my previous system, the Mellon Camp. And this is the part where this is the advantage of being able to stack. You can come up with pretty pictures at the end of your session, in addition to trying to wow all those people out there you're showing this. So my first one, NGC 6781, it's a, it's a planetary nebula. Um, very, very good. Um, resolution of the nebula itself. The stars are, they're not perfectly round, but decently round. Um, these, this in this case, 15 55 second images. So starting off, you would have a nebula that looks kind of granulated, and after about 15 minutes, you would have that. The Swan Nebula, as you've probably never seen it. So this is, uh, in this case, I had a very windy night, so I used um, Shorter, shorter stacks. Uh, this is actually all of them in there. You know, you can take images out also if you uh, later on. But I wanted to show what it would look like at the end of the session uh, here. So this is 15 minutes of the Swan Nebula. Here's the Swan right here. Most people see um, the stars look a little fuzzy again because it was windy that night when I did this. And again, this was at almost Heaven Star Party. The Helix Nebula again, windy conditions, same night. 
this was a great night, <laughs> even though it was windy. Uh, I was able to pick up some good stuff. The ring nebula. It's a small object. I've actually cropped this up a little bit just so you can see it. Um, again, this is um, f about, thir these are 1355 second images that have been stacked. And then the veil. This is uh, 6695. So I've forgotten what part of the veil they call this, but part of the veil nebula. The thing about a Schmidt Cassegrain, which I use, you have a very tiny field of view compared to a refractor. That's the drawback. Even though this is at about f3.5, that's about all I can get with this. And that's also because of the size of the chip. Again, it's a very small chip. I can't use a big one on this. If I use a really big chip, I just have the center part of that, that, that picture illuminated. Some galaxies. Um, the one I showed earlier, this is NGC 7331. Um, uh, this is 10 55 second images. And this is on a not, this is on a, a night when there is no wind. I also want to point out that is a problem. If you have a windy night, you're not going to see much. Even with the Mallon cam, it gets knocked around. Uh, it, it's very difficult. I actually had uh, that sports umbrella that I showed you. I have two of them. I'll actually set that up as a wind shield around the C14, uh, which is huge. Um, it, even that can't help me all the time. But y wind is not your friend when you do video astronomy. Then um, M74, uh, again, 10 55 uh, second images. This is one of the hardest galaxies to see in my C14. If we were looking at this just through an eyepiece, we might see a little bit of the center, and that would be it. But again, you can see it's a very nice, you know, very, very nice, distinct image. And then this is my favorite. Now, I've got to admit, I've cheated here in a way. I've got, notice how many. There are 25 55 second images. This is the Fireworks Galaxy, NGC 6946. Um, Beautiful definition of the spiral arms in this. Nice round stars. It was actually pointed out by uh, Arlen, what's this thing right here? And there are a few other ones. There's one right there. So remember, I'm doing video astronomy, and I wanted to show you what this looks like right off the camera in the field. Those are hot pixels. Now, if I wanted to go back, I could edit those out later on. But this is what the image actually looks like on my 24-inch LCD at the end of that 20 uh, 25 minutes session. It wasn't perfect. That's right. That's exactly right. The no, no. This is just this is raw stuff, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I did not. There's. N I don't take any dark frames whatsoever, or any. What's it called? The gray. Right. Flat, flat. flat yeah, flat, flat. But I don't do those. I could and, and, and prove the image even better. Yeah, so but the Right. Yeah. I mean this is I mean you come up and you look at the screen and go, Oh my god. Did you get this out of a out of coffee paper uh, out of a coffee table uh, book? No, that's happening right now. <laughs> right, right. Oh, if I gave this to it, if I put this in the astrophotography forum, they would just, you know, this is terrible. I can't believe you did this. Go to the video astronomy guys. Yes, George. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got to, th the thing about that is you're talking about doing like one-eighth of a second exposures to take out the, 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 the bad seeing characteristics. Yeah. 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 Yeah, from this. That's exactly right. And I should say, when I say video astronomy, I'm really talking about deep sky objects. I'm not talking about planetary. Right, they got a huge amount of, of stuff. Okay, so I want now. This is from the old system. This is the Mellon Cam, and this is a screenshot off that CRT. Okay, so not bad. Fifty-five seconds. I mean, you've got all the the material that's coming off the the, the small dwarf galaxy here. 
Um, the, yeah, the stars aren't quite as, as round, but that's not bad. Let me show you. So there's there's the same uh, galaxy off the uh, my new system. Unfortunately, again, a windy night. Um, I, this is just, I cannot get a good shot of this with my new system. It's been eluding me for five years. Every time I want to do it, it's cloudy or it's windy. But you can see the different, oops, the difference here between these two. I mean, this is a much more sensitive camera. Um, it's just I can, oops, I can take this and then stack it and get much better detail in the middle and rounder stars. I've been working with the new system for about four years. So let's let's take a look at the new some new cameras out on the market. And and by now, hopefully, I've I've kind of shown you these two camps. You know, video camera, 55 seconds, dump it, bring in the new picture. Uh, video camera, collect the image, stack another one on top, another one on top. You have these two sort of camps, and then there are all sorts of in betweens. So I want to show a couple of cameras that are in these two camps, and then we'll talk a little bit about well, what else can you do. So first off, Mellencam is still out there. Um, this is their latest one, the Mellencam Extreme, $1,300, $1,400. It's, I mean, the sensor hasn't changed hardly at all. Uh, you can see it's a 7 by 5 about an 8, that's about, again, about an 8 millimeter diagonal. The pixel array is about the same. But again, I think this is like a, a 55 second image of the dumbbell. I mean, very nice. And the idea, again, is, is that you, they've they've now gone. I mean, when Mellencam Mellencam's trying to keep up with the new game, you know, they say you can stack these images. Again, I, I mean, I don't know. I I think that uh, because of the pixelation, I mean, yeah, that will go away to some extent. But still, uh, if you're going to go with this camera, you, you, what you really want to do is just show what you're going to see that night and just forget about it. I mean, it's still a fantastic camera to go with. Right. Yeah. This is sort of the Cadillac of those systems. And I'll be honest with you, I'm showing you the Cadillacs. There are other ones out there. What is it? The Revolution Imager. I've looked at some of that, uh, some of the, those images, and they're, they're garbage. It's a $250 system that's supposed to do the same thing this does, but the images are terrible. I haven't found anybody. You can go to Cloudy Nights, go to the, e, the EAA Forum, or is it EEA Forum? Um, you know, it's EAA Forum, and they have a gallery showing these pictures you can look at. That's where I, I, I'm going to show you one that I got from there, um, and there's nothing for the Revolution Imager. So you're going to have to spend a little money to do this kind of work. There's no doubt. This is the one that I would go with. So this one's, again, it's by Atik. Atik makes very high-quality stuff. Um, it's $1,000. You know, it's, that's not cheap. It uses a, a next-generation sensor that... Oh, that my system uses uses the Sony X uh, ICX 825. So it's the same size as far as the pixels are concerned. Um, the sensor dimensions are about the same. This one's supposed to be 50% more sensitive than my camera. The big thing about this is that this has been designed or engineered as a video astronomy camera. So the software that they have does the auto stacking and the display all in one package. That's nice. So that that's this is the way I would go. About the only thing that, that bothers me a little bit, it's not cooled, but again, because this is such a sensitive system, I don't think you're going to have much trouble. This is about, I believe it's about a, a one to two minute exposure of the trifid. So same resolution as all the ones that I've shown you with my new system, only none of the mess of having four different programs you're trying to operate with. Um, or, if you want to, you can start off with this system just as you would with the Mallon cam. You can do that. It's, it, if it's 50% more sensitive than my camera, you should have something approaching the sensitivity of the Mallon cam. You can just start with that and then later on, okay, I want to start collecting images, add a guide scope, you know, and, and, and add the guiding software, and then go with that. You know, this is the, probably the one I would go with. So where's the future going? Both of these systems, by the way, are CCD cool. They're, they're CCD sensors. Well, there's, a, there's an old sensor out there that now has gotten, they've improved to the point where the sensitivity, I think, is even as good, if not better, than the CCDs. It's called CMOS technology. And this is the latest rave on, almost on the uh, forums 
on cloudy nights on, on uh, electronically assisted observing um, is using this uh, Sony IMX chip 224. Um, this particular image is about, I believe, a 10-minute collection of the bubble nebula. It's spectacular. Um, they have cameras available. This Sony chip is in many, in, I think there are about a half a dozen different manufacturers that put this chip in it. Zhao, I believe, is the one that was used um, to, to do this particular image. Um, and those run, the non-cooled is about $200. The cooled is about $500. CMOS is a cheaper technology, so it's not as expensive. Um, the, the size of the pixels are much smaller, yet they get this kind of sensitivity. I think that's pretty impressive. The only problem I see with this is I haven't seen an, a, a complete package or imager like what you get with this for video astronomy. And I'm still looking around. So if you go with this, you're going to have to buy the camera. You have to get something like Deep Sky Stacker Live. You're going to have to try and integrate those two things together to do this kind of work. Oh, it's a tiny sensor. And it, that means you get to focus the light much more intensely on the sensor. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it, I mean, well, now, it's a, yeah, it is. It is a larger, well, it's, la yes, it is. It's a larger sensor array. You're correct, most definitely. Yeah. You can go either way with this as well, if you want to. You can start by just plopping it on the camera and doing a 55-second image and seeing what comes up. Or you can apply the guide camera. In a way, this is the manual system that you can just work with and build up from, just like the other one. For, for a purely auto system, something like the Mallencam is what you want to go with. Sure, you can do it. You need a really accurate mount, though, to do that with. You need like a Losmondi or astrophysics. The, the latest Celestron that I have, I now have the CGE Pro. I have two, the, the two. And it seems to be okay. The previous one, uh-uh, it wouldn't do it. And, and all the other Celestrons, I wouldn't think you would be able to do it. Yes? You can, if you want to... Oh, I, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I always do that through the software. I mean, you could do it yourself, but again, if we're talking about doing electronic assisted, or if you're talking about doing video astronomy, you're trying to do this in an automated way, fashion, so you can show this to people on the screen in the field. So I don't know. Live, yeah, that's right. So in conclusions, you know, we have essentially two different types of systems. Okay, a single image video system, which is like the Mellon Cam, simple to operate, set up. It's much less money than the stacked system, less equipment to use. You don't really need a guide scope. The images are great for viewing on the field. Okay, maybe not so much if you try to take them home and then look at them, you know, on your screen, your LCD. Where if you want to go that route, then you want to go with the, r the way that I'm going now, where I capture the image, I display it, but then I stack another image on top of that and keep going with that. And I use an auto guider and the whole set of equipment that like we've seen with a, a traditional astrophotography system. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Dave? Yeah. Sure. You can. <laughs> yeah, the sports umbrella. Yes. At Sky Meadow, I think my record, I think I counted 75 people <laughs> around my that little bitty v, uh, monitor that I showed for the melon cam. Yes, George. 
Correct. Now, they're trying to go with the traditional chip stacking like this iTech system that I have. That's exactly right. That's their latest thing that they're doing. So they're kind of moving away from, well, not, I won't say moving away. They're just trying to do the same thing. And really, the thing about the Mallinckam system is, is it was really designed as an analog system. So it's hard to take analog, capture the, the, the picture, and make it look correct in digital. And I think the Sky Raider is their attempt to do an all-digital system. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can do the same thing with uh, with the uh with any camera like I was just saying, but one that's tailored to do that like Mallinckam uh it seems to I mean, you know, it, it's just the way to go. I mean, if you're if you're just starting out and you're a novice and you want to try and do what I'm doing, boy, you're going to have a lot of frustrating nights out there. And I had a few frustrating nights as well. It's nothing worse than setting up and having people come up and go, I'm sorry, I have technical difficulties tonight. I'm not showing anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened a few times. <laughs> I'm, still focused. Yeah, I'm still trying to get a God star to this damn thing. It won't work. <laughs> so, Lyle, I, I, I uh, had an opportunity near Salt Lake City to uh, just go out to a dark sky site that I saw on uh, on uh, clear sky clock that this is an observing site. I went out there with a pair of binoculars. Uh, I was the only one out there. And then this pickup truck showed up, uh, two people in it, uh, and out came the card table, big, huge TV, uh, camera, tripod, or the, the mount. They bolted it all together. They had two lounge chairs. Out came uh, a uh, container of wine. <laughs> yeah, that sounds <laughs> and, nice. And, and yeah. they were, were set up and uh, they had it all automated so that they could slew the telescope. They just mm -hmm. had to enter in the, the, the uh, uh, database element, you know, NGC, blah, blah, blah. Right. And the thing slewed over, and a few seconds later, there was a picture of, of it. Deal. So I went over, and, and they, were, they were asking for suggestions. So, uh, okay. okay, let's look at this. Let's yeah, look at fantastic. that. It was awesome. So, so I dream of those nights. <laughs> I don't think I've had one quite like that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they had it pretty well dialed in. Uh, okay. Well, very good. Thank you all very much. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. Uh, they go online. It's just online viewing. Some guys, some place in the United States, some place in the world, will bring up and you can watch what they're doing on it. A lot of times, it's actually uh, Jack Mallard himself that's uh, just running the camera up in Canada. The other thing I really like about uh, the video astronomy, I do it wirelessly on the inside on those 20 degree nights, and I'm nice and warm on the inside. <laughs> say yeah if you want to take the next step you can you can show this all on the web if you want to in real time as you're collecting images and he has a, a group of people that do that it's very nice